Hello and welcome to the Career Speakeasy, a casual, fun, and irreverent place to share ideas about career development, the world of work, and life in general. I'm your host and proprietress, Kelly Nottingham. Growing your career should not be boring. So come on in, pull up a chair, and pick your poison. Hello, everyone. We are on to our second podcast about job insecurity and layoffs. We are talking today about managing the practical sides of losing or potentially losing your job. The previous episode, a little bit heavy, we talked about the emotional states that people go through. So today we're going to be specifically talking more about the behavioral side actual practical steps that you can take to handle the logistical side of life in job limbo or in a layoff situation. These behaviors can be significantly helped with proactive awareness of the emotions that you may be going through. So if you haven't done the work of identifying the fears and the emotions that you may be dealing with, Go back and listen to that podcast. I know it's a little bit woo-woo and touchy-feely, but our behaviors are significantly impacted by our emotional states and by what we tell ourselves about the feelings that we're having. So it's important stuff to do. Go back and listen to it and then come back to this one. If you're afraid you may get laid off, you're dealing with a need to continue a certain set of behaviors while simultaneously dealing with the anticipatory anxiety of what might happen. Now, this can be extremely difficult. You're in a type of limbo situation. You're not sure what's going to happen. And frankly, sometimes you may just wish that the decision were already made and they would tell you something one way or another. Limbo is tough. You just, you're sitting there waiting for the other shoe to fall and it is not a a pleasant place to be. At the same time, you're dealing with all that. You still actually have work to do. So it's almost like you have to have two faces, two approaches. There's what you want to do and feel and what you have to do right now. It's important when dealing with this to separate those two things. You can feel a certain way, you can be upset, absolutely, but you also need to get the work done that you're still supposed to be doing while you're in this situation. So this is a technique that I've actually used when I have been in this situation waiting for the other shoe to drop. Uh, This may sound weird, uh, but if you find that your emotions are getting in the way of doing your work that you need to be getting done on this job, set a specific time, like five, 10 minutes a day to panic and to get that emotional release out. Now, I recommend not doing this with someone who is dealing with the same issues because a fire will feed fire. Venting with someone will cause more venting and you'll just kind of feed off of each other. The way that I have done this in the past is anytime I wanted to worry or stress out, I would tell myself, Kelly, you have to wait until your worry time. Then you set your timer, you journal, you draw, you talk out loud, you go for a walk, whatever you need to do, and you let yourself feel all of that fear and all of that anger in that period of time. Now, what I have found personally and from talking to other people who have done the same thing is that usually you run out of emotions before you run out of time. Once the time is over, though, you're free to go back to your work. And if you have other stuff that you think about later on in the day that you want to worry about, well, too bad. That has to go into tomorrow's worry time. Taking a proactive step to write out a list of things you want or need to do before your job ends, whether you think it's coming or whether you're not quite sure it's coming, can help you feel like you have some modicum of control over the situation. So what projects do you need to finish up? Is there training documentation on any processes that you need to finish? And yes, I know this is hard to do because you might be angry with the company, but if it helps, you can think about the poor person who's going to be stuck in that job next and how are they going to manage without you taking the time to write out that documentation. Get contact information for people that you want to stay connected to. 
do this in advance because even though social media makes it much easier to connect with people, it provides a sense of connection that no matter what happens, you're going to be able to stay in touch with that person. It, it helps. It helps. While you're doing that, ask them for recommendations for your LinkedIn profile. Get those recommendations so you can start to build your professional reputation. Get the contact information for HR or the employment verification service that your company uses so that you can verify employment on future job applications. And find out what resources are available to you through your employer. I am a huge believer in using EAPs which are employee assistance programs that may be called something different at your company, if your company has one. There are vendors that a lot of companies sign up with who provide online resources, online support, chat with counselors, therapy appointments, legal help, financial help, and it's all covered by your employer, all of the costs. So many people do not use their EAP programs because they're afraid that their employer is going to know what the person is doing. They're, you know, I'm afraid that my employer is going to know I was going to talk to a counselor. First of all, these companies that provide these services, they don't share that information. They might share overall usage, but they're not going to share specifics. Secondly, if, if the company is paying for it, you might as well use it. Hello. So if you need help with anything from setting up a budget for your family, setting up will, you can get so much benefit out of these EAPs. Look into them, utilize them while you still have them. If you get your insurance coverage through your employer, make sure to utilize it as much as you can before it runs out. That means going ahead and making all of your doctor's appointments that you would need for the next at least a couple of months, get them scheduled and get in before your insurance runs out. Get any medications that you need filled and potentially refilled as much as they will let you refill so that you have plenty on hand uh, in case it takes a little longer to get new insurance coverage. Don't forget to go to the dentist too. Now, if your job was already eliminated and you didn't have time to do those things, there is still time for you to get some stuff done, connect with your former colleagues on LinkedIn or through other social media or through calls or texts. Let them know your contact information. Let them know that you want to keep in touch. Find out about resources that are available to you and use them. A lot of companies will provide placement services or job loss services when they have to do layoffs, especially if it's a larger company. Don't let your frustration or your pride get in the way of using those resources. They can offer resume help, interviewing help, counseling, financial planning. All of those things are beneficial. So use them. Use all of them and use them early. Get started early with those. If you weren't sure, you didn't get the information that you think that you needed, reach back out to the company, talk to the HR people at the company or your benefits group at your company and get that information. This is not the time to be shy. Understand that those who did not get laid off may be dealing with survivor's guilt. I talked about this briefly in a previous episode. The survivor's guilt thing is real. They may feel uncomfortable reaching out to you. They may feel that they're kind of rubbing it in, that they still have a job and you don't. They may think that you don't want to hear from them. So be patient with them, be open with them, and and give them a little bit of time to adjust to because they they will be feeling different about communicating with you. Some people may actually see you as an outsider now, and they will especially feel that way about sharing information about what's going on at the company. Uh, They may not want to talk to you about that kind of stuff anymore. And you know what? That's their way of approaching the situation. You can't control it. You cannot control the way that they're approaching their situation. So deal with it the best you can. Reach out to them. Don't talk about company stuff if if that makes them feel uncomfortable or awkward. There are plenty of other things in this world to talk about other than that job. 
Apply for unemployment if you qualify as soon as you can. Now, this is for the U.S. specifically. Some states in the U.S. will not give you unemployment until your severance runs out. Go ahead and do your research. Get ready and start that process as soon as you can. Sometimes it can take two or more weeks to start receiving payments, depending again on your state and depending on their process. Also, know what the cutoff for benefits are. If you do start like a part-time job or you start gig work, some states will actually take out the equivalent of any reported earnings out of the money that you would have gotten from them if it goes above a certain amount. So as an example, back in the day, I got laid off at the time I was living in Georgia. Anything over, I think at the time it was like $50 that I made in a week, I had to report to them and they would take out that amount out of my unemployment check for that week. So make sure that you know what the rules are. I have seen and heard horror stories of people that decided to get a part-time job thinking this will help to cover the cost that unemployment isn't quite covering for me. And they lost their unemployment because they were making just enough that the unemployment cut off. So know what the limits are. Also, do not lie about the money that you're making. It is not worth the drama if you get caught. While you're researching unemployment, find out what other services your Department of Labor or Unemployment Office covers. Some cover resume and interview workshops. Some will do specific job placements. A lot of them will have computers and internet access for job searches, etc. So utilize the resources that are there. Find out what's available and dig into those and see what you can use. Now, anybody dealing with either a job loss or potential job loss can do the following. This one is important. Look at your finances as soon as possible. It stinks sometimes to have to look at the finances. It is not necessarily the most exciting thing in the world to do. Finance people, please do not give me a hard time about this. I don't personally enjoy doing budgeting. I think a lot of people don't. But this is a time to move beyond that, okay? Look at what luxuries you may be spending money on. Do you need to go ahead and cut or cancel them until your new normal is set? Gym memberships, spa memberships, those types of things can sometimes be put on hold. Talk to the company, explain to them what's going on. You don't have to go into a bunch of detail, but a lot of times... Gym memberships or fitness company memberships, that kind of thing, they will let you postpone or cut off payment for services for a while. You can go on like a three month hiatus. And when you're ready to kick back in, they can just restart the membership with no problem. The key is to talk to them and let them know what's going on so that you can start to potentially save that money as soon as possible to build up your, your coffers. If you are still paying student loans, yay, you can usually take a forbearance if you lose your job. Right now, during the COVID-19 issue, a lot of the federal loan programs, if not all of the federal loan programs, uh, are putting things on hold. So reach out, take a little bit of time and find out what's going on with those. Yeah, you don't necessarily want to prolong the agony that is the student loan situation in the U.S., but this is one that you can address sooner rather than later to open up some additional funds as needed. So what social costs then can you slim down? Which ones are you less willing to give up? This is a time where you can start to prioritize those things. My sister and I, several years ago, were talking about coffee costs and realizing how quickly store-bought coffee really begins to add up. Uh, so if you're trying to cut back on expenditures like that, they make all kinds of fancy creamers nowadays. So be creative about it. Think about what you're willing to give up on, what you're willing to, to try something different on. And if you have something that is just one of those line in the sand things to say, I'm not giving this up, 
that's fine. You, you'll have to find other ways to make it work. But if that is your priority, then that is what you can do. And you're absolutely allowed to do that. Vacations can be changed to staycations. These are becoming more popular anyway, because frankly, vacations can get stressful, y'all. They can stress people out, and sometimes they're just not as much fun as we want them to be. So instead of taking a vacation, think about things that you can do locally. A lot of times we forego doing the touristy things in our own towns. We don't spend time exploring the free things in our areas that we can do. Free museum days happen in a lot of cities. Parks can be a great place to go take a picnic and spend a day out with the family or with friends. Movie going. Going to theaters to watch movies can be exceptionally expensive. Buying movies or renting movies online can actually really start to add up, especially if you are stuck at home, you're trying to not go out too much. Your local library has a ton of resources that you can use, including DVD rentals. I don't think most people realize this. When I was going through a time years ago when I was on a very, very strict budget, I was working to pay off some school debts that I had accrued after graduate school. I put myself on a very, very tight budget, and I was not going to give myself the luxury of cable anymore. So I went to my local library instead, and I would rent DVDs. And yes, they had a bunch of educational DVDs, but they also had TV shows and regular movie DVDs. So you can go online a lot of times, put them on hold, and go pick them up. If you like audiobooks, a lot of libraries have audiobooks that you can download virtually. There's an app that I love called Libby by Overdrive. A lot of libraries have this app. You sign up with your library card and you can download magazines, books, and audiobooks and and keep them and listen to them, read them and enjoy them without having to pay for a magazine subscription, without having to buy new books, and without having to buy expensive audiobooks online. Speaking of libraries, Libraries also have free internet. They have computers that you can use. They have low-cost printing. A lot of libraries will offer workshops for job seekers. They'll have book clubs for adults and kids. They'll have social groups. There are lots of different resources that your local library offers. And if you haven't gone to a local library in a long time, go to your library. Feel the love for the library. Go get yourself a library card and start to dig into all of the resources that you are privy to as part of our social resources that that everybody has access to. So as I've talked through this, you may be saying to yourself right now, well, I have no idea what our social costs are. I have no idea how much I spend on this. Then it's time to do a budget. Uncertainty about finances really hits on a lot of those most basic of needs that we have. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which some of you may have seen or be familiar with, level one, the most basic stuff are physiological needs. We need food, we need water, we need shelter. Level two is all about safety. And a lot of times when we're thinking about finances and we're worried because we're feeling that job instability or job loss, these are the things that we're worried about. I'm afraid we're going to lose our home. I'm afraid we're not going to have money for food. Um, I'm afraid we're not going to be safe because we don't have the money to provide those basic needs. So budgeting is not the most exotic and exciting thing in the world to do, but it is important to know where you stand. Think about your home life as a business that you are running. You need to manage the income and you need to manage your expenses. If your home life were a business, would you be in the hole? Would you be in the red or would you be in a healthy black where you have savings put aside? So creating a budget, managing the budget of your home like a business will help to give you some sense of control. You cannot fix a problem that you can't see clearly. So do this early to get ahead of the game. Sit down and figure out what you're spending. 
A lot of banks, if you do online banking, actually have budgeting tools on their apps and on their websites. So play with those, figure out what you've got going on so that you can start to make some adjustments as needed and plans for the future. All right, so now that your finances are hopefully in view, you've got them somewhat under control, some other things for you to work on and think about during this time frame to help deal with those practical sides of a job loss. Set a new routine for yourself. Uh, If you have lost your job, your new job is finding another job or potentially starting a business for yourself. Your job is now a job hunt. Your job is now managing your new reality. Give yourself some structure, especially if you're one of those people that thrive in a very structured environment. If you don't like a rigidly timed schedule, if it feels too overwhelming or frustrating or just stresses you out to set times on a calendar that you have to adhere to, then at least set aside chunks of time per day or per week and say, I'm going to spend one hour a week looking at our finances. I'm going to spend two hours a week searching for jobs. I'm going to spend two hours a week reaching out to my network, whatever the case may be. And then you can put those chunks wherever you need to put them. If you're still working in your job and you have not lost your job, but you're concerned you might set aside time each week. This is now a part-time job for you to search for jobs, to work on your resume, to work on practicing for interviews, etc. If you are thinking at this point that you may want to actually start a business, this is the time where you set your schedule, you set your routine to start researching what resources are out there. Small Business Administration has bunches of resources for starting a business, so start digging into those. But set a schedule for yourself, set a routine for yourself. You can even start goal setting around this. So by the end of the week, I will apply to blank number of jobs. I will reach out to blank number of people, or I will learn blank skill. This idea of setting goals and then setting structure around the goals can help you to feel that you have some control because you do. This is the way that you start to gain control of your time, control of your schedule, and control of your energy again. Set up a place for your job search. Now, this doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be some humongous office with a big oak desk and an orchid, but you should be able to be comfortable and have some time and space to focus on what you're doing. Keep a track of login information for all of these different websites and jobs that you've applied for. So when you start applying for jobs online, for those of you who haven't been in the workforce in a while, this is an exciting reality to deal with now. You apply for jobs online and you need to have your resume ready so that it can be emailed out and uploaded to websites with companies that are advertising online. Most of the job postings will require you to sign in to a specific portal to apply for that job. And this is where you need to be ready to keep track of all of this somewhere, either in a separate document on your computer or an actual literal piece of paper where you're tracking, I applied at this company, this is my login, and this was my password for the application. Otherwise, it starts to become very overwhelming very quickly. Now, this also means as you're doing this, that you should set up a virtual place for your job search. Now, what I mean by that is having virtual resources ready for your job search. Google has free email. Google has calendars. Google has a suite of office software that you can use for free. Word processing slides and spreadsheets that you can use. You don't have to use Google if you don't want to. There are all kinds of stuff out there. You don't necessarily have to pay to be able to do word processing on your home computer. You can download programs that will let you do all of that for free. But it's important to go ahead and get all of that stuff set up. Make sure that you have an email address that you can use for your job search that is on your resume. And please, please pick a respectable email. 
I saw an email one time on a resume. I think it was something like sexyblonde at gmail.com. Unless you're applying for a specific type of job, that is not going to be workplace appropriate. So if you want to or need to set up a separate email account for your job search, then do that. That actually would probably make things a little bit easier for you as you're trying to dig through and see what you've applied for and what you haven't. Now, this is a quick side note, and I only have anecdotal evidence from this from colleagues who work in the hiring and recruitment field. I was actually told that there is sort of an unconscious bias amongst a lot of recruiters based on the suffix of your email, your domain of your email. So for example, this person told me if a person has a yahoo.com email address, they assume that that person is in their 50s. And they also assume that the person has not really kept up with technology so much because not very many people use Yahoo email addresses anymore. People that use Hotmail, same thing, but not quite as stark. You may be in your 40s if you use Hotmail, and you probably do deal with more modern technology, but you still haven't quite made the leap into the most current stuff. A lot of folks nowadays use Gmail. Gmail doesn't seem to have as many biases associated with it. Just throwing that out there for your knowledge. So if you are still rocking a Yahoo email address or an AOL address, you need to get something a little more updated. So once you have your respectable email address, it is time to update your resume. Again, this is not something people necessarily do for fun. It is a necessary evil. We got to we got to power through. So here we go. There are tons of free templates online that you can find and examples of good resumes that you can find online. Keep it simple. Keep the formatting easy to read. Don't get too frilly, don't get too fancy with it. The resume's job is to get you an interview. It is not to get you the job. It's to get you an interview for the job. Enlist friends to look over your resume and give you feedback. Keep it to two pages max. Please do not submit an eight-page resume. People look at these things for about 20 to 25 seconds before they decide to keep or throw out. And if you send something that big, you're just going to get lost in the shuffle. Literally. Make it broad enough for someone outside of your role or your company to understand. So when you're writing your resume, avoid specific jargon from the company that you are currently at or that you just left. Other companies may not understand that jargon. The way that the world works nowadays, you apply online for most jobs. And the first screening that happens to your resume happens electronically, usually, especially if you're applying at jobs at very large organizations, your resume will be screened for keywords that match the job description. So if you look at your resume and you look at the job description that you're applying for, and you don't see a lot of relevant keywords from one to the other, you need to modify your resume. Now, again, this gets to be a pain in the butt you're going to end up with multiple versions of your resume based on whichever job you're applying for. But this is the only way to get past those automated screening programs. The next set of eyes, so to speak, that are going to be on your resume are often recruiters at a company. So these are people that specifically work in a talent acquisition or recruitment or HR function. Their job is to look at the job description. A lot of times they've talked to the hiring manager to understand the job better. And then they look at resumes to try to match what's going to work best. And then they will send those resumes on to the hiring manager. The challenge is that these recruiters are usually HR people. They are not people who are specifically in the field that they are hiring positions for. So if you're an engineer, And you get so in the weeds in your resume 
with very, very specific things that you know how to do and you don't have any of those broader key terms that are on the job description, that recruiter is not necessarily going to pass that resume on to the hiring manager. So this is where having a friend to look over your resume, ideally a friend who is not in your job or in your role or in your field to look over it because they're going to be able to look at this and say, I have no idea what you're even trying to say right here. And they can help you rewrite it for a more general audience that will help to get that resume through those first couple of stages of the screening process. The last piece of advice I would give on resume writing is to be as specific as possible using numbers, for example, budget that you managed or that you oversaw, scope of a project, number of people that you managed. Those types of numbers give scope and extent to your skill set. So if someone's resume says, oversaw large company projects. You don't know what that means and what those types of projects look like. If you say oversaw company-wide projects that covered 20,000 employees, $5 million worth of budget, and processes that affected five different states, you suddenly have a much clearer picture of how big the scope of that project is. So think in specifics. This will also help you as you move on to the preparation for interviews. Now, if you're working on your resume and you really do want to get some help on it, don't be embarrassed to ask for support or help from your coworkers, especially if you have other people who are going through the same stage that you are. They're either in limbo or they have just lost their jobs. You can help each other with your resume writing. Meet up for coffee. Email your resumes to each other and go over those with each other. It can help to support other people and it helps to feel supported by other people. So don't be afraid to reach out for help on your resume. So now that you've gotten your resume updated, it's time to start searching for jobs. Use online job searches. This is where the vast majority of jobs are housed nowadays. Back in the day, I remember even back to my my young, tender youth, uh, looking at jobs in the newspaper. People don't advertise most jobs in the newspaper anymore. You're not going to find them. You can go to placement services, staffing companies. A lot of companies actually hire people nowadays through staffing organizations because it saves the company money on the front end with doing background checks, those preliminary interviews, and preliminary placements. You begin to work for that company through the staffing service, and then after a set period of time, the company can decide if they want to hire you on permanently or not. So don't be afraid of going through those staffing companies. They're not just for temporary jobs anymore. You can also use online job searches like Indeed or Monster or LinkedIn. You can set automatic searches that will email jobs to you. You can set criteria, including title, the field, the location, whether you want full or part-time, whether you're open to travel, estimated salary. And those searches will email you daily or weekly, depending on how you set it up for jobs in that location that fit that criteria. As the job search continues, go ahead and start practicing for interviews. Nowadays, behavioral based interviews are very common. These will ask you questions about situations that you've faced in the past. And the goal with these interviews is to predict behavior based on past behavior. So they will ask you questions like, tell me about a time when you had to work on a project that was not going as well as you thought it should. They're looking for the situation that you dealt with, the action that you took, and the result that you got from it. And again, there's lots of information online about how to do these types of interviews. Figure out, if you can, what kind of interview that company normally does and prepare for it well in advance. Prepare by finding sample interview questions that you can start practicing how to respond to them. And the key here is you don't have to have the exact questions that the company is going to ask. 
Be prepared for a broad swath of interview questions. Have answers jotted down and practice speaking them aloud so that you sound comfortable when you're talking about them. Again, this is where you can reach out to friends online, you can get together for coffee, and talk through these interview questions. It's amazing how you can feel prepared by writing stuff down and practicing saying these interview questions and responses. When you enter the interview phase of your job search, your job becomes preparing for those interviews. Prepare for them. There is no worse feeling than thinking that you're prepared for an interview, but you haven't really practiced and you go into that interview and you are just completely overwhelmed with what's going on. The first behavioral interview that I ever did was years ago at the hospital that I later got laid off from. That interview, it was a big deal for me. It was a big jump for me from the type of work that I had been doing to this type of work. And I was really excited. I really, really wanted the job. And when I was scheduling the interview, they told me that it was a behavioral-based interview. So I went online. I researched questions. What type of questions are they going to ask me? And I actually wrote down situations that I wanted to talk about. Situations that made me look great, because obviously you want to look great. But you also want to be prepared with some of those interview questions where maybe things didn't turn out like you wanted it to. Uh, You want to be able to comfortably talk about those things because that's, again, a lot of what they talk about in these types of interviews. When I went to the interview, I took my notes with me. And as they would ask me questions, I would glance down, pick a situation that I wanted to talk about and talk about it. I felt a little silly doing that because I was afraid it would make me look like I didn't know what I was doing or what I was talking about. The hiring manager asked after the interview, what were you looking at on your sheet? And so I actually showed it to her and I said, I I had never done a behavioral interview before. So I went online and I researched and I wrote down some things that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned just so that I was prepared for this interview. They hired me. And with the hiring conversation, my new boss told me that that actually really impressed her that I came that prepared. So I thought that was funny. I was afraid it would make me look like I didn't know what I was talking about. She was impressed with the visible proof of the preparation efforts that I had gone to because it demonstrated for her the kind of quality of work that I do. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of doing that. As you're continuing your job search, think about volunteering. This doesn't have to be directly related to the type of work you want to do. If you can find something related to that, fantastic. If you can't, Any type of volunteer work is going to broaden your social circle. It's going to give you opportunities to network. It's going to give you a chance to learn new skills, show off what you can do to other people, and it gives you a new outlet for your energy. You can also reach out to or join a professional network in your field. Let people know you're looking for work. Otherwise, they can't help you. The same goes with any part of your professional network. Let people know that you're looking for work. If they don't know that you've lost your job, They can't help you find something new. So now it's time for last call. We've talked about in this episode some practical ways of dealing with the logistics of job loss or potential job loss. Yes, losing your job or being concerned that you're going to lose your job can be very tough. It is not an easy situation to get through. So be easy on yourself. Be kind to yourself. Take these ideas one step at a time. If you need to step away, take a walk, breathe, relax. Don't let your job search take up 100% of your time. Exhaustion is not going to help you. So take one or two of these ideas, start to implement them over the next couple of days. But I also want you to take some time for yourself to breathe, to exercise to relax, to try to have some fun, to try to let go of some of that frustration that you may be feeling. Know that you're going to get through this. You will get through this. I believe in you. You're awesome. Take care. Well, thanks for joining me. 
If you have suggestions, feedback, or just something random you want to share, email me at careerspeakeasy at gmail.com and come visit again soon. Cheers. Cheers.